Hi, my name's Nick Chef, and um, this is strange to be doing this to an iPhone instead of a live audience, but um, it's been a strange year, which obviously is an understatement. Um, I'm really honored to be here um, in front of this iPhone and speaking to you, uh, speaking about relationships and addiction, and I really want to say thank you to the Tennessee Department of mental health and substance abuse services, as well as the healthy transition, improving life trajectories and connect to initiatives. I um, wouldn't be here alive at almost, well, in my late thirties, almost 40 really, um, without the help of organizations like this that went out of their way to help me when I not only couldn't help myself, but also was rejecting the help that people were trying to give me. I think that can be one of the most frustrating things when working with people with substance use disorder is that, you know, what other patient who is undergoing treatment is going to be resisting the treatment options given to them in the way that someone with this disease will. Um, so I am very, very grateful for all those who've helped me and um, were patient with me. And you know, it's been really amazing. And, and I mean, I'll, I'll talk about my story a little bit and stuff, but over the last, um, gosh, 10 years really, since my memoir T Tweak came out and my dad's memoir Beautiful Boy came out, and then again, since the movie of A Beautiful Boy came out, my dad and I both, and I um, will just talk about my own experience, which is that, you know, I've been able to travel around to nearly all 50 states, and I've spoken to people from every different kind of background, culturally and socioeconomically that you can imagine. And the thing that I learned is that, you know, addiction is an equal opportunity destroyer. It doesn't matter how much money you have or how little money you have or, you know, how loving your family is or if you have no family support at all, it, it really does um, affect everyone. And um, the good news is that there's over 25 million Americans who are in recovery. And I've met so many people who were just at the absolute you know, I mean, at the, the end of their ropes and had, you know, hit bottom in a way that they'd lost everything and destroyed all the relationships in their life. And through hard work and the hard work of others who are willing to help them, they've been able to not just get their lives back to the way that, you know, it was, it was before or to repair the damage they've done, but they've actually been able to really th thrive in sobriety. And that's the thing that was the most important for me to learn was that it wasn't just possible to have some semblance of a life sober, you know, just survive. It really is possible to feel like when you're, you're getting sober and you're living sober that you're living this kind of I don't know, just beautiful life. Like I, I almost feel like I am on the winning team or something. You know, I, I feel so grateful to be sober and to, um, to have that a life that I have. So going back to the beginning, um, I started, you know, smoking pot was the first thing that I really did when I was like 11 or 12, 11. I um, was at school and a friend of mine's older brother was like a pot dealer and so he brought some pot to school and I tried it that first time and I remember just feeling like this was the answer to my problems really that first time I, I felt suddenly very confident I felt like I didn't care about all the worries that I had constantly up until that point, you know, I'd always felt very uncomfortable in my own skin and, and insecure and um, and just anxious, you know, and, and heavy. And smoking pot took those feelings away at first. They really did. It made me feel like I could, like, go hang out with people and, and not have to worry so much and that I could um, talk to girls and, 
you know, just sort of get through, um, get through life, which was seeming difficult to me. Um, once, you know, I started doing that, it was very quick. I, I, um, I just wanted to be doing it as much as I possibly could. And it was the same with drinking too. I, I, um, was immediately provided this sort of sense of relief by alcohol that made it so that once I started, I, I really had a really hard time stopping. And by the time I was like a, a junior in high school, you know, I was really like smoking pot every day from the moment I woke up to the moment that I went to sleep. I mean, or well, I mean, as much as I possibly could during the day. And I, um, remember uh there was a certain point where it kind of didn't matter how much pot I was smoking it wasn't giving me that same sense of relief that it had given me before and I remember feeling really panicked about that and um you know I wasn't I was depressed and the pot wasn't making it better like it had before and you know what I didn't know at the time of course is that pot and alcohol both are depressants so I had gotten myself sort of trapped in this cycle that, that I wasn't aware of, which was that I was depressed, so I was smoking pot to try to feel better, but really the pot was making me even more depressed. And then I would smoke more pot to try to feel better from the depression that the pot was making me feel, and I would get even more depressed, and it was just this cycle, and eventually I wasn't able to, to get out of it anymore. And at the time, I, I never thought that I could like ask anybody for help. I just didn't think anyone would understand what I was going through and I couldn't articulate to anyone the the feelings that I had and even if I had been able to I I wouldn't have believed that anyone would have been able to make it make a difference I didn't think anyone could change the way that I felt I just felt like that was who I was and you know people say this all the time like life is hard you know get over it or whatever and so I just thought oh this is how life has to be it's like really hard. I didn't know that there was a, a better, a better way, which I do now. But, um, anyway, so what I did instead of asking for help, which is what I should have done, I, um, just kind of dove in deeper and tried to find, you know, other dr drugs that were going to be, um, able to give me that same feeling that pot had given me originally. And so I tried, um, you know, everything that was around at the time, um, you know, Coke and pills and um, ecstasy or Molly or whatever. And um, I also um, at the time was at a party and someone offered me something that they um, said was speed. And um, I took it and I didn't know it at the time, but that was crystal meth. And, you know, at the, uh, this was like early 2000s, maybe. Um, I'd never heard of crystal meth before, um, other than maybe it like being mentioned in, as a joke or something about like what, you know, people in the, in, you know, I don't know, I heard about it as like a joke maybe, but I didn't know what it was. And um, I did that that first time, not knowing what it was and whatever that feeling was that pot gave me that first time I did it when I was 11 years old, this was like that, but times like a billion. I mean, it just felt like this is the thing that I've been looking for. It's the answer to my problems. And, um, I felt like a superhero, you know, like I could just do anything. And so as soon as I did it that first time, I would say I was instantly addicted to it. And, um, I, once, you know, once that started, then I just was suddenly nothing else mattered. All I cared about was being able to get more, to feel that feeling more. And once I started doing, you know, crystal meth, my life spiraled out of control super, super fast. Um, I was like, I just had turned into a completely different person. Suddenly all I cared about was getting this drug and I was staying up for, you know, days at a time and, um, saying crazy things and acting in a crazy way and, you know, stealing from my family and my little brother and sister. And really, um, uh, I was like a non-human person in a way. And, um, 
I ended up going into my first treatment center because um, rehab, because um, it's, a, it's a really stupid story, but basically I um, had this like drug dealer person in, um, in Oakland and I, he had like every drug you could imagine um, he sold. And so I would go over there and I would like get like a list of um, drugs that all of my like friends and stuff wanted me to buy for them. And they would, they gave me their money and um, I went and, um, you know, purchased everything that was on this list. And um, I went, cause you, you, you know, only certain people were allowed to like go visit the dealer and anyway, whatever, it doesn't matter. But I um, went to the first stop on the list to drop off like the first delivery or whatever. And as I was doing that delivery, I started doing some drugs with the friend that I was delivering them to. And um, I, don't, I don't even really to this day know exactly what happened, but somehow it was like 24 hours later and all the drugs that I bought for everybody um, were just gone. And um, I had taken them all and my friend that, whose house it was was like, you have to get out of here, you're acting crazy. So he kicked me out and um, I was like just in a complete blackout and I literally woke up two days later, not woke up, but like came to two days later and I was walking down the street in San Francisco and there was like a cop car pulling up next to me and these two officers got out and they were like asking me questions and I was just like trying to figure out where I was. I realized like I didn't have my wallet anymore the backpack that I'd had full of stuff and I had no idea what had happened to any of it. And so anyway, they helped me to call my dad who, um, lived, <laughs> lived nearby. I mean, I was still living at home at that point. And, um, my dad came and got me and that was when it was kind of like, okay, this is, it's clear that this isn't normal. I mean, I think there was some level of like denial with my family and with myself, of course, that, um, you know, they just thought I was like just partying or experimenting or doing kind of normal kid stuff. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it, growing up in the, in the Bay Area, there was a lot of drugs around and a lot of people were doing them. And so even though what I was doing was like extreme, it didn't seem like that extreme to my family until it got to that point that I was like, you know, I'd been missing for three days and was having, you know, a, a police officer help me call them. And my dad showed up and I was, because I'd been awake for such a long time, I was like super sick and skinny. And, um, he was really freaked out and I was freaked out too. I, I didn't, I hadn't wanted that to happen. You know, it wasn't my, my, my intention to do all those drugs. It was really weird. It was like, I just couldn't stop once I started. And I didn't know what that meant at the time either. So I went to my first treatment center in San Francisco. I was 18. I think I just turned 18 and everyone was like, or almost everyone was like really a lot older than me. And, um, you know, I remember looking around at all these, these adults, like men and women who, um, had had years of, substance, um, histories, substance use histories. And yeah, I just thought, well, I'm not like these people, you know, they're like, they've lost their kids and they've been in jail and they've, um, been in prison and, and, um, you know, they've lived on the street. And I just was like trying to tell myself that, you know, okay, I got, I got it that like, I shouldn't use crystal meth. Cause that obviously had like brought me to a very low place. But when they talked about this idea of addiction being a disease, being a brain disease, um, I didn't r believe that. I thought, you know, cancer is a disease, you know, diabetes is a disease, like addiction is a choice. And I, you know, was making the choice that I was making. Yes. You know, when I was doing crystal meth, I was out of control because, um, you know, that drug is addictive in itself, but I didn't think that there was anything that was like wrong with, with my brain specifically. And although I do remember when I went that, that treatment center, they brought me to my first 12 step meeting. And I remember the woman that was speaking 
was like this British woman and she was, you know, middle-aged. And, and I remember when she started to talk, I was thinking, I'm not going to be able to relate to this woman at all because she is um, British and middle-aged. And, um, but, you know, when she started to, to talk about her experience, which was just with alcohol, which, you know, I couldn't really relate to that much because I, I never even had a, a, you know, a legal drink at that point. Um, but the feelings that she described, like how she felt like she didn't fit in growing up and like, and how, you know, like, a, like she, how other she felt and that when she started drinking as a young girl in England, um, that she immediately felt like she fit in and like she had like a purpose and everything she described, I was like, whoa, that's exactly how I felt when I was doing drugs the first time. So maybe there is this something that is different about me. I mean, maybe I'm one of these people who is like an alcoholic and that, you know, can't drink and use like normal people without having this kind of invisible switch get flipped where suddenly I, I can't stop. But I, I, I had that glimmer of that, but I also just kept thinking, no, I'm a smart guy. You know, I did good in school. I can like... I can, uh, I can master this thing. And, you know, I started like, um, going to see a therapist and talking about my pasts and, you know, my family and everything and thinking like, oh, that's going to fix me. And that's going to make me be able to, um, to, to not, you know, drink and use like I've been drinking and using, but, but it didn't work. And every time, you know, I thought that, um, it couldn't get worse. It, it got worse and eventually I ended up um, relapsing. I ended up um, using, you know, starting to use needles. I started shooting heroin, which I'd always been afraid of before. And um, I ended up waking up in the hospital um, after an overdose with, you know, a tube, you know, a ventilator down my throat and, you know, needles all in my arms and everything. And what I did when I woke up, I remembered that I still had some drugs in the place that I was staying and I got them to take the tube out of my, my throat. And immediately I started taking all the, the, um, the needles and, and the, you know, the, the IVs out of my arm to try to get out of the hospital, to get back, to do more drugs. That was the first thing I could think of. And they literally had to, had to have like a guard, like watching me to keep me from, from leaving. Um, after that happened, I was really, you know, in bad shape from that. Um, I was super sick and I ended up going to a, um, a sober living in, in, um, in Los Angeles actually. And while I was there, I, I, I started to get, you know, I, I was putting some time together sober and I was going to 12 step meetings and stuff. And, um, and I started writing, I started writing a, um, some short stories and things. And, you know, my dad is a writer, um, of course, and he, um, you know, growing up, I always really admired him and, and the work that he did as a journalist. And also I just loved reading. Like I would, I would read authors whose work I admired and who would talk about their feelings of, of not fitting in and, and of being aliens on this planet. And, and, um, when I felt really alone and crazy and I would read about someone else writing about their experience and how they felt alone and crazy, that made me feel connected with them. And it made me feel like I was less, less of just a total weirdo, you know, it made me feel like, oh, there's someone else who feels like I do. And it felt like there was some value in that. And so for me, writing at the time really was like, I want to be able to connect my, my, the pain that I have and the, the feelings that I have with, with another person. And so I was writing these short stories and I would just send them out to anyone that, that, you know, I would get their email online or whatever. And finally I got a couple of them published just in, in some online magazines. And at the same time, um, my dad came to me with this idea about writing an article for the New York times magazine about having a, um, a son who was a crystal meth addict. And, um, you know, I was nervous about that because I was going to be like exposed to the world as someone who had that problem. And he was going to, you know, use my name and his name and everything. But at the same time, I felt like, well, if there's any way that our experience could help other people not have to go through this too, 
then there would be some value in that. And like I said, you know, I d did really understand how much writing and telling stories could allow other people to feel less alone and connected to, to others in that way. And so even though it was scary, um, oh, and, you know, people, just, like I said, just didn't know about crystal meth at that time. Like, Breaking, Breaking Bad hadn't come out. Um, there weren't these, like, you know, campaigns, ad campaigns and stuff across the country to educate people about it. So I thought that could be important, too. So my dad wrote the article. It came out. And um, in the article, he said that I had been sober for, you know, however much time I've been sober and that I'd been writing these short stories for online for an online magazine. So an editor from a publishing company in New York um, read my dad's article, then looked up my short stories, and then she contacted me and asked if I would be interested in potentially writing my story as a book. And, you know, I, I was um, really excited about that idea. I mean, it felt like... Um, I would be able to, um, you know, really be, uh, I don't be able to make this really, this tragedy that my family had gone through, that I had put my family through into something that, that maybe could have some, some value to people. And so I started working on it and I ended up writing about half of the book and, um, they, the publishing company was like, we like this, you know, here's like a little book deal or whatever. And I was, you know, really excited about it. And at the same time, um, my dad had gotten an offer completely separately, um, to expand his book. I mean, his article into a book also. And that is what eventually became Beautiful Boy. So we were both writing these, these books, but then two things happened. The first was my dad had a, a brain hemorrhage. So just out of nowhere, suddenly his brain started bleeding and um, he couldn't walk and talk and had to be, um, I think they were gonna airlift him to the hospital because my family lives like in the middle of nowhere. Um, but um, but they the, the helicopter was busy or something. So they, they got an ambulance up there and drove him you know, an hour or whatever to the hospital. And um, they saved his life you know, miraculously, really, but it was like, you know, he c couldn't talk, walk, um, who, who knew what kind of cognitive function he was going to be able to get back. And for me, I ended up not long after that relapsing really, really badly. And, um, you know, I think probably I was, you know, I felt that fear of, of my, of my losing my dad, who was, you know, when I was growing up, my, my mom left when I was little, and so my dad really was, like, my primary um, caretaker until, you know, he met my stepmom, and then they became my primary caretakers. Um, and I was really, um, I was scared for him, and I, I don't think I could deal with those feelings. And then also, I guess I did that thing that I've done before where it's like, I'll start feeling better, you know, I've got this book that I'm writing, I'm... I'm um, doing well in life, and so I like stop doing all the things that I am told to do in order to like maintain my well-being. So anyway, I relapsed in it, and it was really, really the worst relapse of my life. I was like, you know, really, sh you know, using needles and doing every drug that you could imagine in combination with each other. I kept having these. Um, seizures that I was going into and convulsions and um, I probably would have died except for that I did this really stupid thing which was that um, but smart I, I mean no it wasn't smart it was stupid but it, it did save my life which was that even as I was in that state I was still trying to write and be like I'm gonna finish my book and you know I had always admired these kind of drug-fueled artists who um, you know uh, like I like um, you know Hunter S. Thompson and and Kurt Cobain and you know people I thought like oh they're they use drugs but they're they're artists and they their work is so great and Basquiat and all this stuff and I mean not to mention that you know of course Basquiat and Kurt Cobain both died like super young but still and um, but me I would try to do that and I couldn't do it like I would write when I was high and I would send it to the editor that I was working with and she would be like this makes no sense. Like you need, you need help. Like, please get yourself help. So it wasn't working, but I was still trying. And then I had this 
you know, great idea one night, which is an idea that, um, people on, um, meth get sometimes, which it was that, um, I mean, not this specific idea, but I don't know, for some reason it, it does make people kind of want to take things apart and try to put them back together again. And so I had this idea that I was going to take apart my old flip phone phone, which is what the phones were at the time, and this old laptop computer that I had and put them together and make like an amazing supercomputer cell phone thing, which, you know, if I succeeded would have been like the iPhone. It would have been amazing. I would have been, it's like what I'm talking into right now, but um, I have no technological skills at all. So I took the two things apart, the cell phone and the computer, couldn't put them back together again. And then I was like, oh man, I don't have a computer anymore. I can't write my book that I'm going to write that's going to be amazing. So um, I knew that my mom, who lives in L.A., who, like I said, um, she moved down to L.A. when I was little, and she, she wasn't my um, primary caretaker, but we had developed a relationship later on in life more. And I knew that she had, or I don't even know if this was true, but I thought that she had this old computer in her garage that I remembered that. So I decided at like 5 o'clock in the morning that I was going to go break into her garage. And so I, I went to the part of the neighborhood that she lived. I drove to, you know, which is scary to the part of the neighborhood that she lived in. I, um, broke into her garage. And while I was in there, I suddenly was like, couldn't, I thought there were people outside and I couldn't figure out how I'd gotten in. And I don't know what was going on in my head. I was like piling things around in there. And, um, anyway, it turned out that I was like in there for four or five hours because, um, when I finally like snapped out of it, it was like daytime and um, my mom had come out and she found me out there and she um, had a member of the Los Angeles Police Department with her. And at that point they basically gave me uh, an, op an option to like either go to jail or go to detox. and. Um, and I, this, people think this is funny. Like, that was actually a choice to me. Like, I, I wasn't like, oh, yeah, of course I want to go to detox. I don't want to go to jail. I actually was thinking, like, oh, maybe I should go to jail. Like, then I won't have to, like, give up the drugs that I was on. But then I realized, well, you know, if I go to jail, who knows how long I'm going to be in jail. I'm going to have to, you know, the, I'm going to have to get off all the drugs that are in my system either way. So I might as well go to a detox where, like, someone can help me do that. So it, it wasn't my intention. I didn't want to go at all, but I ended up going to the detox and, um, you know, that started this just absolutely like the worst hell pain detox of my life. And I, um, you know, was super, super sick and couldn't sleep for days. And I was, um, having these, you know, seizures from the, all the pills that we'd been, uh, that I've been taking. And, um, I, uh, was, um, I, I remember <laughs> they only had like, they had like an old VCR and a TV there. And the only thing that I could do was like sit in the, in the rec room of the detox and watch these VCR, uh, v VHS movies that they had, but they had like the weirdest selection of movies. So I was like, so sick and couldn't sleep but I still and I would just stay up all night watching these like random weird movies they had like Sling Blade I don't know if you ever saw that but it's like not a movie that I was particularly wanting to watch at that point and Patch Adams that was another one. Oh god that one I could barely sit through that while I was like dying um, but after that, you know, I just I was so beaten down and so sick and um, and my, you know, my dad had recovered from his, um, from his brain hemorrhage and, you know, my whole family was just begging me to make the right decision and, and agree to kind of go into a longer term treatment center. And I guess, I feel like I just was tired at that point or something. And I, I just finally was like, okay, I, I agreed to go. And, um, I went to this new place and it was the first time that, that, um, I remember someone asking me, like, you know, what is it that that you hate about yourself so much that you need to do these drugs in order to not have to be with yourself? And I remember when someone said that to me, I was like, 
what? What do you mean to hate myself? Like, I don't hate myself. But then I thought about it. It's like, God, I really do. I really, like, I can't stand living with myself. And I realized, like, if I didn't learn how to, to do that and how to, to, you know, love myself as, as cheesy as that sounds, I was, I was, I was going to die. And it was going to be like real, like the end death. It wasn't going to be like some glamorous, you know, Kurt Cobain death. It was going to be like the end of all hope and everything death. And so I just put everything into, um, into doing what they told me to do at this, at this place. And, um, I started working with a psychiatrist and she was the one that first, um, you know, I guess this is the thing I look at, at addiction as being kind of like a perfect storm. All these pieces come together to make someone an addict. I think there's genetic factors, environmental factors. They say that the younger someone starts using, the more likely they are to develop a substance abuse issue. And for me, I think recovery is kind of a similar thing in the sense that it's all these different pieces that have to come together to allow someone to get and stay sober. And so for me, working with this doctor, um, she put, she started me on um, some psychiatric medication, which I know it's not, you know, the the thing for everyone. But for me, you know, getting on antidepressants, um, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and I started taking, you know, lithium for my bipolar disorder. It was like, I started just to be like, oh, that's a piece. Okay, I'm going to hold on to that. I'm going to take this medication. I'm going to work with this doctor. The 12 steps, I started really getting into going to meetings and um, getting, you know, a sponsor like they tell you to get and, and working the steps. And that was like, okay, that's another piece that's starting to like help me to kind of build my life. And, um, you know, the thing that, that, was so amazing to me was that, you know, it really felt like when I was at that point that I, I was at the detox and I'd stolen from my mom, I'd stolen from my dad. I, I, you know, I have a little brother and sister who, um, I didn't even talk about this, but I, I literally at one point when I was younger, you know, stole $5 from my little brother's piggy bank. Like I, I, I hurt everyone in my life. And I had nothing. I was, you know, 24 or five at that, 24, I think at that point. And, um, I had, I, all I'd been doing was chasing this addiction for, since I was, you know, a kid. And I just thought, you know, what's the point in even trying? How, how could anyone, you know, put their life back together like this? But the thing that I'm so grateful for is that I had these people in my life that weren't willing to give up on me even after everything that I did, which I kind of can't understand actually. And they were willing to give me another chance. And so very, very slowly, you know, I started rebuilding my relationship with my dad first, you know, he was the most willing to, to be forgiving at first. And then my stepmom, and then my little brother and sister, and then my, my biological mom. And it was just like these taking these little, little steps and, Finally, when I was able to, to get sober, and really, I was sober for about a year before I, I was able to do this, I, I went back and I started writing my book again, and I was able to finish um, my book. And my dad, at the same time, finished, uh, it was weird, I, you know, he'd recovered from his brain hemorrhage, he um, had, you know, gone through all this physical therapy, and, and um, was, had started writing again and his book was done and my book was, were both finished at the exact same time, which was like a miracle. And so we sent them to each other weirdly. And it was such a crazy experience. Cause for me, you know, I always thought like, if I wanted to kind of kill myself with drugs and alcohol, that that was my business, you know, and, and, um, I was killing myself and I'm sure it was hard for the people around me, but at the same time I thought, well, they can just sort of chalk me off as a loss and, and go, go about their, their day. You know, I thought my dad, like he has this other, my little brother and sister, my stepmom, you can be like, well, I have one dud son, but that's fine. I'm going to, you know, just move on. Um, but reading my dad's book, beautiful boy, I saw that that was never a possibility for him. He never stopped just um, being consumed with, with worry and, and um, anguish over everything that, that I was going through. And I think for him reading my book, it was interesting because he always was get kind of angry with me 
about when I would relapse or when I would be using because he thought, you know, I just was wanting to have fun. That's what he thought was like, I was just out there partying. And I think when he read my book, he saw that, you know, it wasn't like that at all. I, I wasn't having fun. I was in so much pain and I didn't know how to get out of it. And the only thing that had ever helped a little bit was the drugs and alcohol. And so I would go back to that constantly. And then as soon as I started, this invisible switch would get flipped inside me and I couldn't stop because I have a disease. And to me, it's not even a question, alcoholism, addiction, substance use disorder, whatever it's you want to call it is a disease. It's a brain disease. I have it. And you know what? It's not, it's not the end of the world. In fact, um, you know, there are things about it that I'm, I'm grateful for in the sense that, you know, I, I have had to really, um, delve really deep into my relationships with my family and, and my wife and my, um, I'm married now and, you know, my friends and it's like everything it doesn't have to be surface because of what's happened. I, I get to really go, um, into a place of, of being really real with, with, with people, even just people I meet on the street. My wife and I were at a um, hotel the other day and that lady that came and, and brought us, um, and, you know, we're COVID safe hotel, but the lady that came and brought um, us towels or something um, recognized my name and, and she um, had um, read Tweak, I think, and, you know, was talking about how she'd been sober for 10 years. And it was so amazing. It was like, oh my gosh, this is like just the stranger, but I'm having this like incredibly like real deep conversation with them about something about our lives, you know, and, and gratitude and feeling like we've survived this thing, which is possible. So I'm super grateful for that. And if anyone's, you know, struggling with this, just know that it does get better. You know, as long as we survive it and, and can keep, you know, living to put one foot in front of the other, there is always hope. And I've seen it a, a million times, you know, I've, I, I've been at 12 step meetings and there'll be some guy talking to me and he's telling me about all the problems in his life. And they'll be like really serious problems. Like, you know, he's going to get arrested for not paying back taxes or um, child support or, you know, some, I mean, really like big things, even bigger than that. That's maybe a bad excuse or example. But, um, but as I'm talking to him, I'll say, you know, well, it seems like he's, 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 He's screwed. There's no way his life's going to get any better. But I'll always say to him, hey, don't worry. It's going to get better. If you just, you know, stay in the program, keep holding on, put one foot in front of the other. Like, I promise you it will get better. Even in my mind while I'm thinking like, this guy really seems like it's not possible for him. And then I swear on my life a hundred out of a hundred times, six months later, if I see that same guy and he stayed in the program, he stayed sober, he's done the deal his life will be better. And somehow, like miraculously, those things that even I thought probably couldn't get worked out will all have gotten worked out. And it's not, it's not 99%, it's not 99.9, it's not 99.999%, it's 100% of the time. And there, I don't know what it is, but it's, it's really a cool thing. So anyway, all right, I'll, I'll um, stop talking to my phone. <laughs> and um, I appreciate you all um, asking me to speak. And again, you know, Tennessee Department of Mental Health, thank you, and the Substance Abuse Services, um, Healthy Transitions, Improving Life Trajectories, thank you, and Connect to Initiatives. I am very grateful. So, all right, I'm gonna turn this thing off. <laughs>